Good evening, Oak Grove family. Uh, welcome to our evening service. We are so thankful and excited to worship with you tonight. As it is our custom here, we are starting with a reading from God's word. We will be reading from Psalm 96. So if you will, please find in your Bible, Psalm 96, we will get started with the reading from God's word. And the word of God reads like this. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. For he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are strong. You are sovereign and you are good. Lord, we thank you that you have created us and you have created us for your pleasure and for your glory. Lord, I pray right now that we would worship in spirit and truth, that we would bless your name, Lord, that we would sing a new song. Lord, may you bless us tonight as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father God, we do raise that hallelujah for great are you and worthy to be praised. That Father, we as your redeemed, as your sons and daughters set apart in faith, that Father, you may be exalted and glorified. And God, I pray that that is the cry of our heart. That God, you be magnified. Father, I pray that you convict us as you uphold us. That Father, you may sanctify us as you comfort us. May you be glorified. And may this time have been wor uh, worthy to worship you. That you may have been exalted. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening all, welcome along to our Sunday night worship service. We're continuing in our brand new series here tonight. We're so glad to have you with us as we explore the historic Christian creed known as the Apostles' Creed. I'm so glad you joined us tonight. My name is Craig. I serve as the pastor at Oak Grove Baptist Church. And it truly is an honor for me to be coming to you, maybe in your land room, maybe in your bedroom, maybe in your car, wherever you happen to be, to bring this, the exposition of God's word, as we grow together, learn together, and have God speak to us through his inerrant and inspired word. We're going to kick off with the reading here tonight in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And then we're just going to read through the entire Apostles' Creed together, and then we're going to take a look at the opening, the first clause of the 12 clauses of this great creed. Would you join with me? Grab a Bible, and let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. That is the first book in the entire Bible, and it'll be the first chapter, and it will be the first verse. I want to let you know that tonight I'm actually wearing uh, AirPods, and we're not doing this so that I come across as some fashionable young millennial. We're doing this because we're trying to present a better audio quality to our videos. So if that distracts you, let me apologize straight up front, but hopefully you get used to it, I get used to it, and we can dive into God's Word together without any of these other distractions. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a brilliant and encouraging opening word. Let's turn our attention now in light of that verse, the claim of God's creating and God's all sustaining providence over this world. The Apostles Creed 12 clauses reads like this. I believe in God, the father almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's commence our discussion tonight around this opening clause, this introductory clause. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Let me start off, if you would allow me tonight, to read a quote from one theologian, pastor, and author from a generation ago. His name, and many of you know him, was A.W. Tozer. He once wrote this. He said, what comes into the minds of man when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion. And man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater then it's idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be. We tend, Tozer goes on, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual, 
But this is true of the company of Christians that, that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. God's very existence. You will notice not only in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and also in the opening line of the Apostles' Creed, God's very existence is assumed. It is presumed. It is the great all verifying fact of reality and truth itself. The, the creed opens with, I believe in God, presupposing God's existence because God's existence is the great presuppositional truth of all reality itself. God is truth. I believe in God. And without the certainty of God's very existence, there is no truth and there is no reality at all. The revelation that God has offered in his word doesn't begin with an apologetic. This is why we commenced our study this evening, taking a look at Genesis 1-1. And what we saw right there was the reality that God's existence is known. God's existence is truth. God's existence is the foundation for all truth. And the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God in the beginning God. And so God is, and so God was, and so God ever will be. Unlimited, God immutable, God unfathomable, God unmade, God unbecoming, God unending, true God, very God, almighty, sovereign God. God's self-existence, and God has life in himself. God is truth. Now, here is the most controversial fact of all that we're going to speak about here tonight, is that the truth is that all humanity knows there is a God. All people know that God exists. If you would open your Bible with me to Romans chapter 1, we're going to read verses 18, 19, and 20 together. And it reads like this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, since they are, and so they are, without excuse. The scriptures do not say that man knows there is a God because mankind has been sufficiently clever enough to work out the truth of the existence of Almighty God. In fact, the scripture tells us very clearly that the onus is on God. God has made himself known. Mankind universally knows the existence of this one true God because God in heaven has revealed it to them. Unbelief. People who say, I don't acknowledge the existence of God. I don't believe there's a God. I don't confer my life. I don't, I don't, I don't buy into this whole God idea. People like that are not truly unbelieving. They are truly in denial. And what the text tells us is that clearly God's existence has been perceived ever since the creation of the world. Someone claiming their disbelief is simply confessing that they are suppressing this truth, this knowledge in unrighteousness. That's the simple reality that Romans 1 reveals for us. God has taken it upon himself to reveal his very existence, his very being, his very essence to humanity since the creation of the world. And God has owned the responsibility of revealing. And all and every human soul that says, I don't believe in God. I won't acknowledge that there is a God. I won't bow the knee and confess with my tongue the lordship and the supremacy of God. They are suppressing this knowledge in unrighteousness. God is not unclear. God is not an unclear communicator. God is not an inept communicator. God is not an unable communicator. But like all mankind, those that suppress the truth in unrighteousness, those that do not want to acknowledge God in their life, they are guilty of sin. They are guilty of their rebellion. They got the message. They got the communication from heaven. And as Romans 1 tells us, they are without 
excuse. The denial, to deny the belief in this God of the Scriptures, this divine supreme being, is about as compelling if someone ranted and raved and said to you, I don't believe in the existence of words. You would be, you'd be flummoxed by that. You'd be confused by that. You can't use words to try and demonstrate and prove your disbelief in words. And in much the same way, you can't try and use logic and reason and the world around us to disprove the reality of the God who is communicating through logic and reason and the world around us. Belief in God is the foundational principle of all knowledge and all truth in and of itself. Disbelief and denial, rejection of God's truth is culpable sin. Mankind from the beginning of the world, is morally accountable before a holy God and they must, in humility, embrace God's work of self-revelation. Now this creed, this creed isn't just talking about general assent to the existence of God. It's not a creed for agnostics to just believe that there might be a God or there, there could be a God. God could exist somewhere. But this creed demonstrates that the God of the Bible has revealed himself relationally. God of the Bible has revealed himself in an unclouded and a clear demonstration of his divinity and his eternal power. This belief we call saving faith. This belief has as its primary center the person and the work and the redemption wrought by Jesus Christ. But that friend, that's getting ahead of ourselves. Let's keep our focus on this opening clause. I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. We believe. We believe. We believe in God savingly. We have faith to trust in God and his revelation in the scripture and his hope of the promise of eternal life in Jesus. We believe that. Because God has promised and set forth his truth in his word. This kind of faith is spirit imparted and implanted faith. God has poured out his illuminating spirit into our hearts that we might not just believe with general assent that there is a God, but that we might with a heart aflame with trust hold fast to his promise in his word. We believe. We believe. What this means is that because God has communicated to us the truth about his person, his being, his creative work, his redemptive work, God has communicated this in the divine, inspired, infallible word that we call the Bible. We believe in God. God has revealed himself. And God's self-revelation is God's description. We should hear What God says about himself and not pretend that God has left it up to each and every one of us to fashion and mold and form him after our image. Here's the truth of it. God's description has not been left up to you and I. And we should never attempt to use our imaginations to conjure up images or descriptions or fashionings for God that are not entirely merited by his word. When people presume to speak for God, when people presume to speak for Jesus, when people presume to speak for God and Jesus, when people presume to do that, then the God and the Jesus that they claim to be speaking for always ends up sounding more like them than the very God of holy inerrant scripture. In this regard, let God alone speak. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We learn here from God's self-disclosure that this great holy creator was in the beginning. He is timeless. He is peerless. He is glorious. And according to his goodwill, he brought forth creation. He is the maker and the sustainer. Of all, not just things seen, but the scripture tells us that he also creates and sustains those things that are unseen. In Colossians 1, Paul draws this clarity. He draws attention to God's act of creation through Christ. 
Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. What we learn from this in the holy inerrant scripture of God is God is before all things. God creates and sustains all things. And God has divinely set the purpose of all things. All things have been made ultimately to tend to the glory of God and the manifestation of his sovereign supreme decree. What we see here. As we look at the creed, we we open up with the line, I believe in God the Father Almighty. God the Father Almighty. Now, this word Father can be taken in several different senses. There there can be the, the realization that God is Father in his triunity. We understand the scripture reveals God to be one supreme, ultimate, and eternal essence. But that this divine essence exists in three distinct persons who are each fully God and who each exhaust the divine nature. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father alone has the quality of fatherhood because only He has properly begotten a Son. There is in the Holy Trinity a Father, the one that Jesus prayed to in his earthly ministry, Father who art in heaven. That Father we know in John 3.16 has begotten his Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus being fully God, equally God, entirely God, is also an eternal person who exhausts the divine nature, the Logos. In the beginning was the Logos was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Son, Jesus Christ, has the quality of sonship in His personhood because He has been begotten by the Father. These three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are equal in power, wisdom, glory, and sovereignty, co-eternal of the one and the same essence. They each enjoy personal properties which are distinct to them alone. And so the first line of the creed draws our attention to the eternal Father in the being who is God. I believe in the Father, the almighty God who is Father. But I said that there were three senses that we could understand God's fatherhood. The first sense that we've drawn attention to is God's, the Father's fatherhood, the person of the Father, his begetting of the eternal Son, the Logos, who we know in the scriptures as revealed as Jesus Christ. But the second sense that we could acknowledge God's fatherhood is his universal fatherhood. We know in Ephesians chapter 4, the father is called the father of all. We understand that Paul says in Acts 17, when he's on Mars Hill debating with the Areopagans, when he's debating with the professional philosophers, he says that in this God, we live, we move, we have our being, for we are all his offspring. There's a, there's a universal fatherhood of God over all creation, over things seen and unseen as God rules and reigns and is the true possessor of all things. He is the father. But of course, more specifically and gloriously for us and for our experience, the third sense that we celebrate and acknowledge God the father's fatherhood is, of course, his fatherhood of those unique sons and daughters who have been adopted in Christ. The spirit of adoption, Paul says in Romans 8, has been poured forth into their hearts, made them new, regenerated and adopted, having justified them by grace through faith on account of the righteousness of Christ. They are brought into the family of God. Not begotten children, Christ alone is exclusively that but adopted in the family of God. This, we know, is the true and unique privilege of those who by grace and their faith have received this good news. All these three senses are inherent in the usage of belief and confession that God is Father. We are compelled by reason to acknowledge this is the revelation of God. If we are in Christ, If we are in Christ, 
We call God Father, not just by the law of creation. We call God Father by the privilege of adoption. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. He is for you and I, if we are in Jesus, if by Jesus's righteousness, Jesus's death, his burial, his resurrection, if by those things we have come to taste and experience this new life, We are brought into the intimate family of God. We are brought into this glorious relationship. There's one more comment here in the Apostles' Creed I want to draw your attention to. What we'll do is we'll read from the start. and We're closing out with these thoughts here together this evening. The opening line, we've restated it and stated it again tonight. I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. This last and final consideration for our sakes here tonight is considering the fatherhood of God over his son, Jesus, truly begotten of God, very word, very God, very divine. This Jesus. Now, Jesus sits at the right hand of the almighty father, reigning and ruling in what theologians have often called the session of Christ. King of all the world, King of all creation, Lord of all lords. This Jesus has gone to glory to await the Father, to make all of his enemies his footstool as he grants sovereignty to the throne of the Son, the name above every name. I'm going to ask you tonight as we look to close out our discussion and consideration in our believing of God, the Father Almighty. Is he your Father? I I, I don't mean your Father generally by creation. I mean, is he your father by adoption? Have you found yourself in Christ being a recipient of this gospel of Jesus? Are you born again? Are you saved? Are you forgiven? Have you found this freedom in Christ to know God of all glory, God of all creation, to know him as your unique father? Would you close with me as we pray? Ask God to bless this consideration, this study to our hearts. Let's go before the Lord together tonight. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this creed. We thank you that this creed echoes, Father, your revelation in Scripture. We thank you, Father, that you have communicated through your word that you are God of all. You are creator of all. You are almighty, the the maker of things seen and unseen, whether thrones, dominions, rulers or powers, and that they are all made to tend to your glory. They are all made to serve your divine purpose. You, God, a creator and father of all. Father, I ask you tonight as we're praying that you help us to, to consider even more intimately your personal fatherhood over your son, Jesus Christ, and on account of that, your personal fatherhood over all, all people who have placed their trust in Christ, who are in union with Christ, who are adopted into your family and co-heirs with this Jesus. Father, I thank you for that. I I, I pray that as we've studied this, this first clause of this historic creed, that people listening to me right now would begin to examine their hearts. Are they truly in the faith? Do they truly have Christ? Are they united with Christ by faith? And can they call upon you who judges impartially? Can they call upon you as father? God bless this word to us tonight. May it bear fruit in our lives and glory to you in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I pray this word has been a blessing and an encouragement to you. Would you stick around just for a few more moments tonight in our service as we look to sing our adoration? And our thanks to God together. God bless you. Thank you. And have a great evening.
Close with a word from the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 33. Please join me in reading. O oh, the death of the riches, both of his wisdom and the knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has ever first given to him and has to be repaid? 
For, for from him and through him and to him, to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And with that, we wish you a good evening. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next Sunday.